international social economy actors, vet providers, and also uh, EU cross-border uh, projects uh, testimonials, as you will see. We have chosen these topics because they are both very high on the, our social agenda. Uh, in Europe today, uh, we can see that long-term uh, care services are often unaffordable or unavailable. Uh, in the labor market, there are more and more shortages linked to the long-term care sector and also the healthcare sector. And uh, that is why uh, we are taking action uh, in, in this field. And very recently, we adopted a, a, a care strategy and a proposal for council recommendation on uh, long-term care. In fact, now, nowadays, there are over 6 million people uh, working in the long-term care sector, but we estimate that by 2030, we will need additional 1.6 million workers um, in, in this field. This is linked, of course, to the fact that population is aging, but also to to low wages and poor working conditions uh, in these uh, specific sectors. And um, of course, the workforce is also aging and the number of qualified graduates is not increasing at the same pace um, as, as these developments. So um, it is essential that we work together in retaining and attracting uh, workers to these sectors. And that is why uh, these strategies, these initiatives that we are launching are putting a lot of focus also on skilling as part of um, uh, to, to a factor, a key factor to address uh, these, these challenges. So, um, in this respect, uh, the skills required have evolved a lot uh, in, in the care sector and are, are increasingly complex. Uh, we are talking not only about traditional skills, but carers often need to have uh, specialized skills like linked to new technologies, linked to um, digital skills, soft skills, and, and communication skills. So, initial and continuing training opportunities, including on the job, like apprenticeships, can improve the attractiveness and quality of the care work and also um, reduce the turnover uh, of staff. So in this context, uh, the social economy is also very important because they are usually um, providers of long-term care services, among others, and they have also the potential to contribute to improving the working conditions in the care sector. This is because social enterprises are often driven by a strong social mission and they put people at the center of their work and try to achieve positive impact uh, on their communities. So that is why uh, we also launched a, a new social economy action plan um, that uh, calls for setting up a right environment uh, uh, for the social economy to, to also contribute uh, to the care services. So let's explore today how apprenticeships can be an excellent uh, learning pathway to achieve this, these objectives. But um, before we start, uh, we were planning to launch a, a mini poll to see uh, our participants, uh, where they come from. So please, uh, maybe we can launch it already. I encourage you to participate so we know uh, who we are talking to. Very well. So I see that uh, replies are going up. Um, maybe in the meantime, I can also uh, talk about the house housekeeping rules. Uh, I cannot see it properly because of the poll. OK, um, the results of the poll, I see that there are a lot of public authorities, uh, training providers, labor market actors and other participants. So it's quite balanced and, and mixed. So, so this is good uh, that we have a, a good mix uh, of our uh, alliance uh, members. So the conversation uh, is uh, rich. 
So before we start with uh, our speakers, uh, some housekeeping rules. Um, please keep your microphone and camera turned off uh, at all times. We encourage you to use the chat to leave comments and interact with other participants during the event. There will be uh, occasions for Q&A, so we will um, have a look at your comments and actively reply to your, to your questions. Um, the event will be recorded because we know that while some of you are participating uh, live here with us, there will be many other people having a look at the webinar exposed um, and uh, we would like them to be as many as possible and that's why we are recording. And if you are experiencing any technical issues, please feel free to uh, contact our uh, support services from Ecoris um, in the email that it's uh, signaled uh, on screen. So now we are ready to start and uh, uh, the first uh, speaker uh, is Elias Libanos, an expert uh, at CEDEFOP, our agency specialized in vocational education and training, and he will set the scene for today's webinar. So uh, Elias is an expert in skill strengths and intelligence, and uh, he will share with us some key findings uh, from the CEDEFOP 2023 skills forecast regarding the care sector. So Elias, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning and thank you so much, um, Anna, for the introduction. It's uh, excellent to, to be here where, as you say, I'll um, highlight a few key findings for your sector coming out from the uh, newly uh, launched 2023 skills forecast. So if we can proceed to the first slide, please. If I may start just saying a few words about the skills forecast without getting into any technical details, all you need to know at this stage is that it is a unique database developed by CEDEFOP, which looks into the future a period ahead uh, 10 to 15 years and estimates uh, future demands in terms of employment across uh, sectors, uh, occupations and uh, qualifications for its member state uh, individually and a few more countries. Next slide, please. There are uh, many users uh, for the skills forecast, but um, to be a bit uh, humorous, we do want to uh, avoid situations such as uh, the one shown in the uh, in the slide where uh, this gentleman has decided to become an astronaut and only realizes that there is no space station in his village when he's uh, visiting the local employment uh, office. Next slide, please. So how do we build the skills forecast? Again, without getting into details, what we do is we adopt the most likely to happen scenario. That means that we use the official projections regarding economic activity elaborated by uh, the European Commission, and we also utilize the population projections. And we translate these into future jobs uh, and skills. So uh, the 2023 skills forecast has assumptions regarding COVID, takes into account the geopolitical tensions, and does look into the energy prices. And on top of this, we have added a number of greening assumptions because we do believe that greening is becoming uh, mainstream, so it should be part of the uh, baseline projections. Next slide, please. Starting. Uh, getting into the results and starting with the supply side, what this slide shows is the future growth of the labor force broken down by gender and age for a number of uh, member states. So the main message that we can take from this slide is that the, um, the share of older people that is uh, 55 and above will be growing, denoted by the uh, dark blue color that you see in both blocks and you see that in uh, for both males and females the picture is more or less the same but the question is what is the implication of this so uh, what I used to do is I utilize the spinning top metaphor which is uh, if you see is the little toy on the top right and uh, you all know the spinning top we have all played with it when we were kids but uh, the point here is that a good spinning top is like the one shown in the picture that means it is thick in the middle and it is slim on top and on the bottom and this is how a good workforce should look like so the core workforce that is the prime aged workers the, their part in the labor force should be thick and the top and the bottom should be uh, should be thin but what's happening now as you know time passes and the spinning top keeps spinning is that the middle part is becoming thinner 
and the bottom part, which is the older age part, is becoming thicker. So this is not good for your spinning top and definitely does not look very good for the uh, workforce. And of course, this also has implications about your sector as well, because uh, aging sector means uh, more needs for your services. So let's move on, please, to the next slide. If we get into uh, future employment, this is uh, this slide shows how the uh, the aggregate sectors uh, their employment in the future will vary, and you see that human health and social work is one of the sectors that will grow the most in terms of employment. And if I remember correctly, it will grow uh, something like 12% uh, percent to 2035. Next slide, please. If we move now into occupations, here is a detailed list of occupations. They, uh, they're ordered by skill level. So on the top, we have occupations requiring high skills, and then the skill intensity goes down as we move down the list. Again, it is a heat map. So the darker, the, uh, the strongest will be the growth for 2035. And you see that I have highlighted with some arrows the occupations and the jobs that they are related to your sector. So that is health professionals, health associate professionals, personal care workers, and the supporting occupations, which is uh, some legal, social, and cultural professionals and cleaners and helpers. So the key message for you here is that for almost all countries, these occupations will grow in demand. And again, as I will show later, this may have some implications. So next slide, please. This uh, slide shows the distribution of uh, the uh, care sector across countries. And the first observation to make here is that it is quite strong in the north and in the west. But when you see the eastern countries and the ones in the south, their sharing total employment is actually quite low. And this could be challenging given the AIDS uh, megatrend. But of course, it's a sector if we may stick to the previous slide, please. Thank you. Uh, it is a sector that has grown a lot since 2010. It has grown by one fifth and it has created many, many jobs. And there are quite a few jobs expected to be created by 2035. So please, next uh, slide. And this is a picture for 2035. This is the number of, jo of jobs that the sector will uh, require. So a bit more than 10 million jobs in 2035 about 5% of total jobs and the growth until then would be something like 7.3%. And on the right, you see the distribution across skills levels in terms of formal educational qualifications. And you see that the biggest share will be for highest qualified individuals, but the big share, and I think this has implications for you, will also be for medium qualified uh, individuals. And uh, next slide, please. This is how the uh, employment growth will vary across member states. You can see that there is a great deal of variation. Uh, at the uh, two edges, you see on the one side we have Greece, and on the other side we have, let's say, Spain. Uh, the common feature is that they're both aging very fast, but Greece will experience an increase in the sector, while uh, Spain is due to experience a decline. Um, and this, of course, will have implications about how uh, the trends will affect the, the capacity of the, of the sector to, to properly function. Next slide, please. So this is a, uh, a chart that shows a future employment for uh, three uh, headline years, if you like, for the key occupations and the main picture here to paint is that um, there are five occupations mainly for your sector. They will all grow in demand. Uh, the key message maybe is that health professionals will grow a bit faster than other uh, occupational groups. For instance, personal care workers may even experience a, a small uh, decline. But maybe the, the key message here is that your sector is going through a skills upgrade, which is not something unique, of course, to your sector, but definitely does have implications. There were also uh, mentioned in the introduction about uh, uh, the changes given uh, digitalization of work and use of automated facilities. Next slide, please. 
so getting towards the end of my presentation, this is a new indicator that we have elaborated and it will feature for the first time in the uh, forthcoming ESTE uh, report. And it is the future shortage indicator that breaks down future shortages into three elements and then summarizes this in a single indicator. So we have demand uh, coming from expansion. So we see the uh, future demand because uh, the occupation is growing. Then we look at the supply and we see what are the implications for job openings because there will be the need to replace existing workforce because of retirement, because of uh, exit of the labor market or any other reasons, uh, movement between jobs. And then we look at the possible future imbalance because of the educational credentials required on the specific occupation and what would uh, the available supply be there by 2035. So again, I have highlighted the occupations that are most related to your sector. And what we see is that the, uh, the shortages are expected to be quite strong in your sector. All occupations have this common feature, even in the, the next slide where uh, we have cleaners and helpers. Again, there will be strong shortages for the future. And again, this may have implications. We heard about difficulties in attracting and retaining the workforce. So this may be intensified in the future, but uh, of course, uh, we don't um, have a crystal ball at CEDEFOP, which means that this is what the future will look like if uh, no actions are taken now. But if actions are taken now, maybe it will be a bit more uh, optimistic. So I think uh, next slide will be just a, a summary of what I, I presented. I'm not going to repeat it again, but it shows uh, the key uh, the, let's say the, the, the key trends happening in your sector. So uh, with my next slide, I will, I will thank you for your attention. I'm more than happy to answer any questions uh, at the time allocated, or you can reach me by email. And also I think there is a mini poll, which uh, you may uh, launch now regarding my presentation. So thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, Elias. Um, it was a very, very interesting presentation. You showed us uh, even more impressive figures than I than I thought. So the challenges uh, are quite high in order to attract and, and retain uh, all these workers into the um, healthcare and long-term care uh, sectors. So um, I think while while people uh, submit their replies uh, to see if they've been attentive, <laughs> um, there are a couple of questions for you. Um, someone asks if um, in other occupations you included non-conventional medicine and when the report will be published and the, the forecast. Thank you. Thank you for these uh, questions. So um, I did not elaborate on the methodology. We do uh, rely on official classification, so we use ISCO for occupations. So I assume that the, uh, the group that you're referring to, it is classified in one of the ISCO categories, possibly non uh, elsewhere classified, but it will belong into the uh, professionals given that an educational uh, a higher education degree is re is required for this uh, for this practice so uh, the answer would be would be would be yes even though it may not be let's say explicitly stated into the into the classification and the second uh, question is about when the report will be out uh, the database is out which is one thing so it is open to the public you can visualize it uh, using the predefined uh, high charts that we have prepared. You can even download the full data set and explore it based on your uh, capacity and uh, um, is to use uh, data sets, of course. There will be a, uh, a set of report that will include some key findings that will come out in the next uh, in the next weeks. I, I assume there will be no there will not be a dedicated skills forecast report, but there will be various uh, reports that they will be uh, utilizing the, the materials from the skills forecast. As I said before, feel free to, to get in touch 
uh, with me for any details. I'll be more than happy to, to answer. Thank you. So Elias, many thanks. And before I uh, introduce the other speakers that uh, will um, uh, let us know how they are addressing these challenges at their level, um, maybe you can let us know what's the right answer to the poll. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, most of the participants got it right. It was actually presented in the slide uh, number two, which is uh, ten million three hundred thousand, would be the correct uh, the correct answer. Perfect. Uh, many Thank thanks. You're welcome. So um, now it's time to to introduce uh, our uh, speakers uh, that will talk about uh, apprenticeships uh, linked to the the care and the social economy sectors. So I uh, welcome you and thank you for being here today to share your knowledge, your experience that I'm sure it will be very, very inspiring uh, to our participants and we will all learn and uh, make new links and uh, um, partnerships. So first, uh, Alexander Hubel, uh, head of the Department for Vocational Training and Engineer Qualification at the Federal Ministry for Labor uh, and Economy in Austria will let us know about the recent reforms linked to apprenticeships and, and the care sector. Then uh, Elena Seniz Herrero, uh, International Relations Coordinator and a teacher also at Institut Bonanova, uh, which is a training provider located in Catalonia, uh, Spain. Um, so uh, uh, she, she will let us know about their experience uh, in, the, um, uh, in the healthcare and care sector uh, and the training programs uh, in Institut Bonanova. Then Anna, Cat Anna Cazzato, project manager at Consorcio Consolida, a group of cooperatives, uh, so part of the social economy in Italy with links to the social and care sectors where will let us know uh, about their programs. And finally, Anna Barbieri, my colleague in the unit in DG Employment, who is team leader for apprenticeships and Erasmus Plus, which is funding, among other initiatives, Centers of Vocational Excellence. And she will present um, one of uh, these projects linked to healthcare, EUBECA. And we will also have a video um, from uh, uh, the, the, the project uh, manager. So now we will start uh, with a concrete initiative uh, to increase the offer and effectiveness of apprenticeships in the care sector in Austria. So I, I hand the floor to, to Alexander. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Um, um, yeah, the, the first slide. Um, as you might know, in, in Austria, we have a very uh, uh, well-established system of apprenticeship training with a long tradition, like also in Switzerland and in Germany, but also in other uh, states of the European Union. <clears throat> And about 40% of uh, the, the age cohort in the secondary education level to uh, our apprentices in Austria. Um, but in the healthcare sector, the, the, the education or training pathway has its own uh, systematic approach. Uh, uh, and uh, up to now, uh, the apprenticeship system wasn't open also for the for the um, for the uh, healthcare sector, and now we want to establish that our government has has decided to establish also an apprenticeship training program, a regular apprenticeship training program for the healthcare sector, additional to the existing education pathways. Uh, yeah, the program. Thank you. Uh, Status quo, as I've said, the legal basis uh, for for uh, training of of, of uh, skilled persons are the Healthcare and Nursing Act, uh, the German word is Gesundheits- und Krankenpflegegesetz, and in this act there are three qualifications levels in this system. Uh, the, the nursing assistant, uh, which which has a training period for of, of one year. Then the advanced nursing assistant, which has the training period of two years, and then the certified health and nursing care, uh, which is the, the, the third level and is um, um, 
the trained or educated at universities of applied sciences and uh, closes with a bachelor degree. Um, yeah, that's the status quo. And um, yeah, also in Austria, we have a high demand of, of uh, persons uh, who, who um, uh, will work in the healthcare sector. So uh, the, uh, an, a recent study said about uh, 75,000 persons, uh, which are additionally uh, needed um, up to the year uh, 2030. Um, yeah, the, the, the motivation is also uh, to, 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 to use or to, to, uh, to open the, the proven model of the in-company training um, uh, of the apprenticeship system, which is uh, learning in practice, for practice. That means the education, we, we have two learning places that the, the company which uh, will be a, a healthcare institution and uh, the, the vocational schools. Um, we have international uh, agreements, but also uh, in Austria, uh, in the in the as a legal um, as a as a legal uh, basis uh, to 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 look at the. Uh, the, the age of 17, which uh, is um, uh, which is uh, important for 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 uh, for working at at patients or or, or, the, or the, the the persons who who are uh, in within the the, the healthcare institutions. Um, yeah, one. Uh, Good thing I would say for the for the young persons are that the apprentices in Austria receive an income that's a difference uh, to the school-based uh, learning pathway. Yeah, and uh, we have also the permeability uh, up to the um, the the, uh, the third. Uh, um, um, level uh, which is uh, educated at the universities so the new model uh, looks like that we have nursing assistant which will uh, have a which will have a, a training period of three years uh, and uh, the first the fourth first year would be the, um, the, the the additional education um uh, element for becoming an advanced nursing assistant. So, to to uh, we have these 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 two elements in one uh, apprenticeship pathway, and after that, it is possible to um, to uh, continue at the University of Applied Sciences for for the um, uh, for the for the higher degree. Uh, yeah, so that's the model in, in, in a short description. Um, yeah, the legal basis are uh, like now the Health Care and Nursing Act, but also the Vocational Training Act, Act, which is the legal basis in Austria for the apprenticeship system in general. Uh, yeah. Do I have a, one more slide? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, that was just a, a really short uh, overview about our uh, plan. Um, the, the legal basis are now in discussion in the parliament um, and the training profiles are also uh, finished and will be uh, getting in force or will be uh, uh, gotten in force in in July, so that the first um, the first uh, apprenticeship apprentices uh, could start uh, with the beginning of the next school school year. That means at uh, September. Yeah.
Many thanks, Alexander. Uh, very interesting to see how these apprenticeship programs evolved and you not only uh, consider like general programs, but also advanced. Um, I think I may follow up with a couple of questions that we already have in the chat, if that's OK for you. Yeah. Um, so Agnes uh, from Etuk, uh, she's asking how much is the income and uh, if apprentices uh, receive additional support like uh, travel or material. And, and then Thanos uh, from Greece, he's asking what are the EQF levels for nursing assistants, one, two and three years of training? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the incoming will start at the first training year um, um, with uh, about 700 euros. And at the fourth training year, uh, the, the income will be about 1,500 euros per month. Um, yeah, 14, uh, uh, 14 uh, remunerations per year in Austria, like for every worker. Then the next uh, question was, um, I think the EQF levels, a um, uh, nursing assistant is EQF4 and uh, advanced nursing assistant is EQF5. But that's now, that's the, the status quo and that will not change uh, um, with the new system. Um, and, and what's the age range? Uh, this comes from the chat as well, from Arya. The beginning age. The, 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 the age when they when they can start after the night we have a nine year obligatory compulsory uh, education in Austria and after that it is possible to start so normally uh, with the age of 15 or 17 the most beginners of an apprenticeship training in Austria are um, already uh, 16. So that the, the specific uh, uh, competences which will be trained at the, uh, at the uh, persons of the, of the, um, in, the, in, the, in the institutions will start at the second uh, at training year. Now we have this, uh, this, this uh, legal uh, um, uh, restriction of 17. Huh? Mm. Okay, many thanks. Well, I see that uh, what you explain on the remuneration, I mean, make uh, may make these programs uh, very appealing uh, for uh, potential participants, and you will surely attract uh, a lot of people. Yeah, I think so. Uh, in Austria, the, 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 that's that's normal that the apprenticeship get a re remuneration, and uh, the the the. the the high uh, or the, the, the amount is, is, is agreed in the collective uh, uh, agreements by the social partners. Many thanks, Alexander. Yeah. Um, we will have the chance to keep on discussing later on, but now I think it's time to move on to our mm -hmm. next speaker. Thank Elena Senis from Institute Bonanova in Spain, a vet uh, institution, and she will explain how her vet center approaches apprenticeships linked to the care sector, particularly the healthcare uh, and social care. So, Elena, the, the floor is yours. Many thanks. Thank you very much for your introduction. Um, yeah, as you said, I'm uh, the international relations coordinator and teacher in Institute Bonanova. And what I would like to present today is our experience in a very specific program, which is work-based learning or dual apprenticeship in the healthcare sector. Um, yeah, so first of all, I would like to introduce um, ourselves because um, we are a vet provider, a vet education center, public center, but we have a very special uh, situation because we belong to a very big health consortium which has healthcare centers, education centers, and research centers. So within the healthcare centers, the most important one is Hospital del Mar in Barcelona, a very big hospital. We have other hospital and also primary healthcare centers. And particularly interesting for this audience, we have also Centre Forum, 
And this center is a long-term long care center in which have rehabilitation, uh, mental health care, and patients which require long-term long -term care. They are, um, well, they get this uh, service within this uh, center. Within the education centers, there is Institut Bonanova, which is where I belong to, which we are a health, um, healthcare vocational education and training center. But we also have some faculties from University Pompeu y Fabra, all the faculties that are related with, related with health, such as the medicine faculty, the nursing faculty, physiotherapy, and the biology faculty. We also have some research center for biomedical research and also IS Global, which is a research center more focused on epidemiology research. So as you see, we are a very big consortium that tackles all the possible um, uh, point of point of view of uh, the healthcare service. Yeah. Okay, next slide, please. So what I'm going to present you today is a very specific program we have in our center, which is work-based learning or the dual apprenticeship. And um, well, here our students get their education both in our institution, in Institut Bonanova, in our education center, but also at the hospital, so at the working center. So um, this uh, program is articulated through a collaboration agreement within, between all the parts. And very importantly, the relationship between the student or the apprentice and the hospital is done through a fellowship. And we will talk uh, a little bit more later about this fellowship. So next slide, please. So the advantages of this system, um, well, we, there, there are advantages for all of us, you know, for, for the institution, for the student and for the hospital. For us, for the education center, these kind of programs allow us to improve our relationship with the other members of the consortium. We, it also allows us to exchange and transfer knowledge about among all of us, all the centers. It also improves the student's learning process and also increases the student satisfaction. Uh, for the student, it allows them to combine a study and work. They allow it allow them to access the hospital resources and all the other members of the consortium resources. They acquire professional competencies. They get an economic income, which is important for students too. Uh, it improves their professional curriculum and it's, they have an easier insertion uh, in the working market. And for the hospital, it also has advantages because it improves the hospital uh, workers' qualification. It contributes to their uh, corporate social responsibility. And also, and, and I think very important, the future workers of the hospital, so our students, they already know the working processes and the culture of the hospital. For the hospital, they, it also allows them to have a talent identification and also create a pool of candidates to cover vacancies. So what is the process? How can the students access this, prog this program? Well, first of all, we need to set a collaboration agreement and this collaboration agreement is signed by our uh, education center, Institut Bonanova and the hospital. It includes, includes the collaboration terms and also a follow-up committee for the students. Then there is a learning agreement and this is signed by the three parts, the Institut Bonanova, the education center, the hospital and the student or the apprentice, yeah? And this learning agreement includes all the practical details of this, uh, of this collaboration. And then there is an activity plan and this activity plan includes in a very detailed manner all the activities that the student will develop at the hospital. So this will be the paperwork and the next part is the selection process. And this selection process has two parts, one of at our school and the second one at the hospital. At our school, we need to meet the education department requirements we we'll check the academic record, but also we check the personal competences of the apprentice and the students. And at the hospital, they do 100 hours, the selected students from the school, they do 100 hours of practical period. And then after these 100 hours, they do a personal interview with human resources. If the student passes the selection process, it ent they enter the period at the company. And this would be 900 hours in two years. And they have a supervisor from the company, which is a trained person to be a work-based learning supervisor. There is a follow-up and evaluation, and 
we do this through monthly and trimestral reports, and there is an evaluation of the activity plan and the personal skills. And if everything went well, the students at the end of the process can get hired by the hospital. So as I told you, um, the relationship with, of the students with the hospital is done through a fellowship. And this fellowship has um, uh, give the student the advantages of like a, a work contract, even if it's not, because the students are registered to social security in Spain, the sick leaves if they are sick are included, and they get a small remuneration. And this remuneration is for the first 450 hours, 60% of the interprofessional minimum wage, which in Spain is around 1,100 euros. And the second year or the second 450 hours is 70% of the interprofessional minimum wage. So you see that the students get a part of the uh, interprofessional minimum wage in Spain. So what is the current status of the program in, in, in our school? We have right now 14 fellowships. Mainly we have this fellowship with Hospital del Mar, with the hospital, but we also have uh, six fellowships with different um, service providers, which are companies that provide services to the hospital, so they are very uh, interrelated with the hospital. So we have um, students from biomedical, uh, clinical and biomedical laboratory of anatomical pathology students also and health documentation. In the image provider service, we have diagnostic imaging students. And in the uh, clinical um, diagnostic provider, we have, again, a clinical and biomedical laboratory students. And I think that's all from my side. Ah, if we have some time, I don't know if we have some time or we are a little bit tight. I have a small video in the previous slide uh, from a student, one of the experience of the student. Um, if you click in the link, and I think we have to set up the subtitles because it's in Spanish. Maybe we can have a look at it. We can share it in the chat, Elena. Uh, okay, that's thank perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, so with this, um, if you go to the next slide, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And if you have any particular um, doubts or questions that you want to discuss personally, you have my email and also the uh, work-based learning coordinator email. And again, thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, Elena. It was very, very interesting, your presentation, a quite unique model that integrates the collaboration with uh, all the important actors that you need to have on board for apprenticeships and also for the care profession. So I, I think it, it, it it's very inspiring. And uh, I, I already see a lot of questions um, in the chat. Um, Okay, so I, I, I will tell you a couple and, and then maybe you can reply uh, everything together. Uh, Arya is asking uh, about the age range. Um, again, Agnes uh, from Etuk, uh, she's asking about the percentage of those who are not selected after the 10th uh, our period um, by the hospital and what is the percentage of those who are employed by the hospital um, that provided the apprenticeship. Um, okay, that's that's also interesting. And from my side, um, knowing, I mean, you mentioned that there is a selection procedure to, to access apprenticeship, so only the best uh, can do this program. Um, and I was wondering whether in view of these uh, shortages in, in the sector and, and the trends that uh, were explained by our colleague in CEDEFOP, if you are considering to increase the places uh, for the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if I remember everything. I was writing it down. Uh, regarding the age range, so here we are talking about high vocational and educational training, so meaning that our students are more than 18 years old. Normally the range is between 18 and 20, but they can be older also. Uh, regarding the percentage of the students that get selected, um, Depends on the program. As I show you, we have students from different study programs. So um, depending on the program, the program that I know best is the one for clinical and biomedical laboratory. And last year we had three students selected from the school and only two remain in the company, meaning, well, the percentage is quite high. Two thirds remain in the company for the program and one student got 
you know, didn't pass the first selection process. And, um, and I think you asked me something regarding the selection process and you said we select the best and that is true, but there are other criteria that we take into account. A lot of our students want to study further in university. They want to go to medicine, biology, nurse, whatsoever. So we prior prioritize the students that do not want to study further, but rather they want to work. So even if the uh, academic records are better, if the student expresses the intention of um, going to university and further studying, then that uh, doesn't give them that many points to do this work-based learning. Because, and that links to the next question, pretty much 100% of the students that do this program get hired by the company. So right now, all of them, all, all of the students that have done work-based learning are hired now in the hospital. That's why we prioritize the students that express their intention to work after the program and not continue studying. Um, I think I've answered all the questions. I don't know if I forgot something, anything. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's that's uh, perfectly fine. And um, I think you underline many of the elements that we always promote about apprenticeships uh, and, and the close links with the labor market mm -hmm. and uh, how this really increases opportunities to, to be employed mm -hmm. after the, the learning pathway. And also you made references to many of the, the, the features that we want to have embedded in the systems and that we um, proposed in the council recommendation on effective and quality uh, apprenticeships. So thanks a lot. Uh, we will have the chance to continue talking afterwards, but now it's time to move on uh, to our next speaker. Uh, so now we turn to Anna Cazzato, who will present the work of the group of cooperatives Consorzio Consolida in the Italian region of Puglia uh, on apprenticeships. So Anna, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you uh, to everybody. I um, just uh, introduced uh, my organization. Um, I, the Consortio Consolida I work with uh, is a network of uh, 22 social enterprises uh, cooperating with uh, municipalities, profit and uh, non-profit organizations within the territory of uh, Lombardy uh, in the north of, uh, of Italy. Um, Consortio is a second level organization employing uh, 2,800 uh, people in the province of, uh, of Lecco and uh, um, each uh, um, and social enterprises uh, uh, are engaged in uh, uh, social, healthcare and educational um, sectors and in the job placement uh, sectors. We support and uh, accompany the empowerment and the citizenship of uh, different groups of people, so family and minors, uh, um, early childhood, young people, uh, and uh, uh, vulnerable uh, adults for their work uh, inclusion, um, prisoners, women, victims uh, of violence, uh, um, unemployed with uh, frail uh, fragility, migrants, etc. Um, as I already said, these activities are carried out by the 22 social enterprises uh, in co-projectazione with the institutional public bodies. What, uh, what is the role of uh, Consorzio Consolida? Uh, is, um, uh, Consorzio uh, makes available to the, to the members um, several services to facilitate their uh, operations in the area. Um, for example, uh, um, we, um, as uh, Consolida is accredited by the Lombardy region, so is engaged in uh, supporting continuous training uh, on different matters. Uh, um, administrative management. Uh, we support also uh, cooperatives, uh, social enterprises uh, um, with the, the stakeholder management, uh, research, analysis and insight. Uh, but uh, what I really think is our uh, strength is the fact that uh, Consolida offers a concrete, uh, um, uh, some concrete places where social enterprises can uh, discuss and develop uh, tools. So this is what uh, um, uh, this is related to the um, to the wall to the to the general uh, information about uh, Consolida uh, linked to the uh, apprenticeship. Uh, I, I can say that Consorzio Consolida is a member of uh, APAF, the Lecco uh, Apprenticeship Network. 
counts uh, AP, uh, APAF in Italian, counts uh, 15 members uh, and uh, it includes um, a vocational training center and trade uh, association. Uh, the role of APAF is to manage and uh, monitor the resources uh, destined to, um, for uh, uh, basic training. The funding passes uh, through the Ministry of Labor and Social Policies uh, and uh, is uh, su uh, subsequently distributed by the Lombardy region to the Lombardy prov provinces. Um, Consortio Consolida is a um, leader of uh, some uh, sectors in the province of Lecco. Um, these sectors are very um, important uh, uh, for the uh, apprenticeship uh, um, paths and processes. Uh, for, um, for almost 15 years, uh, Consolida has um, assumed the, the role of coordination and management of uh, YAF policies uh, in the province of Lecco through the implementation and management of uh, projects uh, aiming in uh, acting in response to phenomena uh, such as uh, needs uh, um, or uh, youth unrest and uh, marginalization. As already said, uh, Consortio Consolida runs a multi-purpose vocational training center. Uh, this center is a, a, a service for our internal cooperatives, uh, our internal social enterprises, but is also a very strong tool uh, for uh, young people. Every year, the center uh, welcomes more than 100 young people uh, aged between 14 and 19 uh, years old. And uh, finally, uh, Consorzio Consolida is also accredited, accredited to the employment service uh, through the Messieri Lombardia Agency. This service uh, is uh, responsible for the design and the management of uh, pathways uh, for uh, accompanying people belonging to the weaker segments of uh, uh, society to, to the work. Uh, so next slide, um, next slide please. Um, what I want to share with you today uh, are um, our three type of uh, uh, um, uh, experiments and experimentation about uh, apprenticeship. Um, consider that uh, uh, it's a simplification I do for this webinar. <laughs> there is not a so strong uh, division among uh, uh, apprenticeships in our um, uh, cooperatives. The first uh, practice uh, is when the social enterprise uh, looks uh, for a professional uh, for its uh, staff and services, uh, for example, social or uh, health services. Uh, um, I call, uh, call it apprenticeship for internal workforce. The second practice I want to share with you uh, refers to the um, WISE in their mission. Uh, wise, uh, the WISE look for workers for their services, uh, but are very uh, ready to share uh, um, these uh, um, workers with uh, the labor market, the external labor market. And uh, very often uh, people selected for uh, apprenticeship are uh, weak people coming from need for example. And the third practice uh, is when uh, Consolida is engaged um, through Living Land, our YAF program and uh, Mestieri Lombardy in uh, supporting uh, young, fragile people uh, in getting a job in the local, uh, in the local labor market. Next slide. Mm, so mm, I want just to share with you uh, some uh, key elements of, the, um, uh, of these uh, practices. Um, as you can see, um, the targets are very different. Uh, in the first uh, example, uh, we uh, look for uh, people with, uh, with um, look for uh, talented people. Uh, there is a, um, a, a great investment on uh, people uh, selected uh, um, uh, during uh, uh, the recruitment uh, phase. And when we um, found someone that it's, uh, uh, has uh, a big potential, but uh, needs some uh, uh, accompaniment, uh, uh, we propose the, um, uh, the apprenticeship. In the other two uh, um, examples, um, the uh, target are uh, neat or vulnerable young, uh, young people. This means that uh, um, we consider the, um, um, the wise, uh, the apprenticeship offered by the wise and uh, uh, living land and uh, Mestieri Lombardia as uh, a step <laughs> during the uh, accompaniment of uh, young, uh, fragile uh, and uh, weak uh, uh, people. Um, so uh, mm, 
what we experimented uh, for all the three examples, uh, we have some problem with uh, uh, heterogeneous participant uh, uh, for the classroom training. So there are uh, obviously the two level uh, training, the classroom and the, the basic uh, uh, training and the on the job training. Uh, for uh, um, we experimented uh, in uh, some of our uh, social enterprises uh, uh, um, the training uh, um, focused uh, on the um, specific uh, social uh, enterprises, for example, uh, Iris. And uh, uh, this was very, this was very, uh, very um, uh, strong uh, uh, path, uh, strong uh, actions because uh, with the homogeneous participant that uh, will uh, will work in the same organization, uh, the uh, the training uh, will um, potential uh, um, potentiate the the culture of the of the organization. For uh, um, fragile people, um, neat uh, or uh, young people uh, uh, um, that have uh, that has not uh, any um, particular uh, um, educations, uh, the fact that uh, um, people will share uh, the the same uh, perspective, work perspective, uh, is uh, something uh, very very strong. Um, one of the uh, risk we uh, we see is that um, um, as for classroom training, we see for uh, all the example. Um, um, sorry, uh, a wise uh, um, as one of the step of uh, as I already say uh, the wise example and the um, mysterious living land. The first the first example are uh, considered as a path as a step of the path uh, um, uh, for a young people uh, program. Um, but the third example differs from the second because uh, um, here Living Land, the program uh, Living Land and Messieri Lombardia are directly engaged in uh, supporting the access to the labor market for vulner vulnerable uh, young people. Apprenticeship will be uh, offered by the firm, so uh, reassure that uh, um, the, um, the, the, the path uh, previously offered by the project and uh, by the fact that uh, in addition to the internal tutor that the firm uh, will um, give to the, um, uh, to the people, to the apprentice, um, Mestieri Lombardia, so our uh, social enterprise, um, guarantee another tutor, an external tutor uh, that help uh, um, the firms to welcome uh, um, weak and uh, fragile, uh, fragile people in uh, their uh, organization. Uh, so um, this is what we experienced uh, till uh, till now. But uh, what we uh, see is that um, we meet uh, uh, a very um, some uh, um, a, a very change in uh, our uh, um, relation with uh, the this, uh, this type of uh, contract. Um, in this uh, period, we are we are experimenting uh, an unexpected uh, recruiting uh, recruitment crisis. Uh, so, um, apprenticeship request uh, an investment from the organization and also from participant. Um, our experience say that it is very important when we offer uh, um, this uh, type of uh, contract uh, to be very uh, honest and very clear uh, about the path about the fact that uh um, the um, remuneration uh, uh, is uh, less than uh, the other workers in the organization and that uh, an effort of responsibilities uh, is uh, asked uh, to everybody, also to apprentices um, with their, uh, their work. Uh, sometimes uh, um, this uh, could be uh, a risk of uh, misunderstanding with, uh, with people, um, but now with uh, this uh, recruitment crisis, uh, that is uh, experimented by all the sectors, economic sectors uh, in, uh, in Italy, I can say. Um, the risk with uh, the first example, the first type, uh, is that uh, um, few 
people are available, few, uh, few um, workers, uh, and they prefer to uh, accept uh, uh, other types of contracts. Uh, and they um, prefer to have the, um, uh, the complete remunerations. Uh, and uh, uh, if we don't help them to understand the advantages of apprent uh, the apprenticeship, is, uh, this could be um, a, a risk. Mm, but uh, um, what we um, uh, verified is that uh, people that uh, entered with uh, the first uh, um, apprenticeship example uh, are now uh, um, coordinators and are the best performer in our uh, organizations. This is why in uh, social enterprises, uh, in, uh, for my ex experience uh, in the region I work, Mm, uh, there is not the culture of uh, uh, continuous training um, and uh, uh, this is a way um, to experiment uh, this approach to the to the job uh, and I think uh, it's something we can uh, reply also in, uh, in other uh, contexts. Uh, an unexpected uh, opportunity <laughs> come from uh, the second and the third example um, because uh, mm, for the first time, uh, um, um, firms uh, or uh, uh, um, organizations of labor market that were not uh, interested in uh, our uh, workforce, uh, the, the weak people or the fragile, uh, fragile people, uh, have so, are so hungry <laughs> of uh, personnel so that uh, they welcome and they uh, ask to us to uh, um, to help them to find people and they accept um, people with fragility uh, knowing that uh, we um, are uh, behind them and we accompany them with uh, uh, the second uh, second tutor. Uh, so uh, let me close with the, the last uh, slide. Um, very few uh, data. Uh, you have to consider that uh, we are now approaching to uh, evaluate uh, this type of contract. So um, uh, it, it, it is a, a start for us to, uh, to deep uh, um, to deep this, uh, this um, way of uh, introducing uh, um, people in our organizations. Uh, we are uh, uh, reflecting on what about cost benefit investment. Uh, as uh, I said, uh, um, for what um, for the um, when the uh, apprenticeship is well done uh, is uh, a great uh, uh, investment uh, uh, for our uh, personnel. But we experimented also uh, a lot of uh, uh, interruption. Uh, you can see the, the second graphic. Uh, um, more or less uh, half of people we uh, introduced it with apprenticeship uh, interrupted uh, the, 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 the activities uh, before the three years uh, norm period. Mm, we incremented our apprenticeship during the last uh, years, but now um, maybe we are in a trend reversal uh, due to uh, the recruitment crisis I share with you. Um, and uh, um, we are we are reflecting also about uh, one of the uh, point of uh, one of the strength of apprenticeship, the fact that uh, is uh, uh, a permanent contract. Uh, uh, but uh, we are now facing a new reality in the new generations. Uh, we are not so sure that they are interested in a permanent contract. Uh, so maybe um, this um, uh, um, element uh, that in the past was uh, a strength, uh, um, maybe is not uh, uh, now something they uh, look uh, they look for. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Many thanks, Anna. It was uh, very interesting to see how it works in practice. A social enterprise, also linked to the to the care sector, how it offers opportunities for young people, for adults, and also for people uh, with a disadvantage. No, because of uh, the person-centered approach and the impact that it wants to have uh, on the territory. 
So uh, also a very interesting insights, uh, sometimes unexpected. So um, about the permanent uh, uh, job contracts and so on. Uh, we have a follow up question from from Agnes um, on uh, I think the first one you have already addressed, um, maybe on the remuneration. She's interested in the level of remuneration, the rate of employability, and why are the what are the reasons um, why many apprentices uh, interrupt uh, the program. Um, the remuneration is uh, 80, uh, 85% uh, um, from 85 to 90%. Um, I see that the request is also about the investment uh, both for a company and for apprentice. Um, it's an investment. Um, uh, it means that uh, uh, we request to, to people to uh, engage uh, themselves uh, uh, in the training and in the job activities. Uh, and sometimes uh, if uh, we are not so clear, uh, it's, um, it's a problem for, uh, for us because we invest uh, on, uh, on people without uh, uh, the, the same investment from them. Uh, and uh, uh, the um, about the uh, the in interruption uh, there are some uh, consideration we have to to do about the uh, human resource uh, abilities uh, of uh, our sectors uh, to um, uh, of being clear in the and um, uh, explaining in the right way uh, the, the process. Uh, um, apprenticeship uh, is not so well known, I think, uh, among uh, young people uh, in, uh, in, in our sector. Uh, and um, sometimes uh, they uh, start to, uh, um, to understand in the few days uh, that we'll have the, 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 the same job in, uh, in another uh, organization uh, without doing uh, training or uh, um, not, uh, not viewing the added value of, uh, of the path. So there, is, there are some uh, um, our responsibilities as a social enterprise and also some uh, opportunities uh, uh, people have uh, in uh, doing other, uh, uh, getting other jobs on activities. Many thanks, Anna. So, uh, yeah, so there is something, uh, uh, some efforts to be added in terms of awareness of investing in long-term uh, programs uh, rather than the short-term um, uh, thinking. Um, I think uh, we are running a bit behind, so we can maybe uh, address some of the remaining questions later. And now we can um, continue with our next speakers, Anna, who will talk about uh, some uh, EU project centers of vocational excellence linked to the care sector. So the, the floor is yours, Anna. Thank you very much, Anna. Good morning. Indeed, I would like to underline to you uh, one of the funding opportunities under Erasmus+, Plus, which is called Centers of Vocational Excellence, and that can be very relevant for the uh, care sector and the social economy to address the challenges that have been uh, described by the previous speakers as well. Next slide, please. The Centers of Vocational Excellence are Erasmus Plus projects which aim at uh, creating and strengthening that uh, institutions that are able to adapt the skill provisions to the need of the labor market in a swift manner. So it can be relevant also for the care sector. These projects bring together uh, a variety of partners to cooperate. It can go from uh, vocational training institutions, universities, chambers, social partners, um, public authorities. Uh, all of these partners, of course, are engaged in the main aim, which is developing uh, skills uh, provision. Um, these centers, we say that they act local, so they are strongly connected 
to the local and regional reality, to the skills ecosystem, and they provide the conditions to develop the skills that are re uh, relevant for a specific territory. But they also think global because they cooperate internationally through Erasmus Plus and through the partners of the project. These centers, they work uh, um, on different areas. They can be sectoral, so for example, focused on automotive or tourism or the healthcare sector, or they can tackle horizontal challenges like it could be social inclusion inclusion or sustainability or others. And these uh, projects are expected, these uh, centers of vocational excellence are expected to go beyond the traditional provision of skills for the labor market for young people. They cover initial VET, but also continuous VET, and they provide a variety of services and activities to the territory and to their partners. These projects, we are funding um, at present around 12, 15 projects every year. And these projects have a budget of 4 million each and a duration of four years. Next slide, please. Here you see a list of typical activities that can be undertaken by the Centers of Vocational Excellence. A project doesn't have to do all of these activities. They can choose some on each of the three uh, strands. So governance and funding, teaching and learning, and cooperation and partnerships. You can notice that under the third strand, cooperation and partnerships, there is also one of the activities that concerns apprenticeships, which is a strong link then to what we have been discussing uh, during this uh, webinar. So um, now I would like to mention that one of the projects that we are currently funding is in the sector of health care. It is called the uh, European Platform for Vocational Excellence in the care, Health Care Sector. And uh, we have asked uh, the coordinator to be present today, but uh, it was not possible. So we will have at the end of my presentation a video on this uh, project. I would like to say a few words to introduce this project. Uh, the UVECA project, so the European Platform of Vocational Excellence in Care, as it is called, UVECA, is a project that has started in 2022 and will run for four years. It uh, concerns the development of innovative skills for the healthcare sector. And it concerns also the creation of vocational excellence hubs in seven regions. The project will develop the skills through virtual innovative workshops, activities like blended mobility, project-based learning, and it will also develop internship and, app and apprenticeships opportunities for the partners of the project. So they are also looking into the European Alliance for Apprenticeships to see how this initiative can uh, support them in developing these uh, apprenticeships. We can go to the next slide where I would like to conclude. So I've uh, digged out uh, the motto of the European Alliance for Apprenticeships. It was valid a few years ago, but I think it is still valid today. For companies, we say that apprenticeships are an opportunity to train and gain. And for learners, individuals, they are an opportunity to earn and learn. And then I think that uh, this is the introduction also to the video of the UVECA project. And I invite you, if you are interested in these uh, Centers of Vocational Excellence project in the health sector, you can contact the coordinator for more information or for seeing if some of the results of this project can be beneficial for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. So I think now we will see a video, right? Yes, exactly.
we cannot hear it. Thank you, Larisa. We are checking the audio. In the meantime, uh, Anna, many thanks for the presentation. I think um, uh, the presentation on the Centers of Vocational Excellence is still um, very useful for uh, our participants also to be aware that there are these possibilities uh, to, to apply for this, these projects and also to partner with other relevant actors uh, that may they may find here also through EAFA. Um, so um, uh, are we ready for the video? No. Um, Just maybe Leila, if you unmute yourself, maybe. Do OK, let me try. Mm. I already see that some people are interested in, in getting in touch maybe with the coordinator of, of the center. So that's that's very good news. This is exactly why we think EAFA is, is useful, uh, because it makes people um, get connected. Uh, and um, many, many members have already um, find partners to collaborate, uh, to, to set up projects, also to, to build uh, a partnership for mobility of apprentices. Hmm. So I see we are having technical issues. So maybe uh, we will, I, I don't know if the video is published um, and we can uh, maybe share the link uh, with our participants and uh, we continue uh, with uh, the discussion. Unless you tell me otherwise. Okay, so let's do that. OK, so now I invite all the speakers to get back uh, to stage and switch on the camera. We had envisaged a um, lively discussion as, as the last part uh, of uh, our webinar with uh, different questions and, um, and topics and, and interactive. But it turned out that the presentations were very rich and you already were very, very active with follow up questions after each presentation. So now we are reaching um, uh, 1230 where we would need to, to wrap up. So in the meantime, I propose like a simpler uh, setup. And uh, maybe uh, I, I will uh, have a quick round uh, of, of uh, remarks and comments from all our speakers uh, based on the discussions that we've had uh, so far. And if they want to underline um, anything that they missed in the first intervention or a reaction uh, to other speaker um, or otherwise just the challenges that they see ahead uh, in their sector and then um, we will wrap up. So uh, I will give the floor first to Elias uh, in case he wants to say some final uh, remarks or comment. Thank you. So um, I think in my presentation I highlighted what would be the challenges ahead for your sector, especially with the uh, future shortages that we may see and the fact that the sector is growing, but uh, the workforce is aging and you have issues with attracting and maintaining workers. So uh, given the fact that we see a big increase also for medium level um, occupations in, in your sector that, you know, the occupations are aging from uh midwifery to dentistry and uh, and so on and so forth um one way out could be to try to activate more people where we see that participation rates are actually quite low so for instance we see that uh, for highly educated the participation rates are almost 95 uh, percent but when we look at medium level educated people and especially for females we see that the uh, the rates they're considerably lower so uh, it could be a good way to be in a position to attract uh, and activate unutilized talent that there is out there by offering 
programs that they could be suitable, they could be um, a, a way to engage back with the labor market and, and gain some uh, some income. So this is of course just uh, just an idea, some uh, some thoughts based on the the evidence that I have seen for your sake. Mm. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, many thanks, Elias. Yes, in fact, I mean, many of our uh, recent strategies focus on untapped potential of activation of uh, uh, new workers, uh, particularly women, and uh, needs. Uh, also, as uh, in the competitive strategy, this this was uh, mentioned. Um, so now, Alexander, uh, would you like to to make any remark? Any final remark? Um, yes, I I have uh, given a, just a short presentation about our uh, plan and uh, yeah, a little bit like in Italy, uh, we we want to 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 use our established uh, systems for 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 going forward in the in the care se- for for education in the care sector. That's uh, that's my main message, I would say. Um, and we want, uh, we do not want to 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 change uh, something at the uh, at the quality level or or at the, at the quality uh, instruments within the institutions, but only using our uh, instruments which we already have, like also supporting uh, tools for apprentices like coaching. Or, or the possibility to take uh, part in, in training alliances and something else. Yeah. Thank you. Many thanks, Alexander. Uh, now it's your turn, Elena. Yeah, I would like to answer one of the questions that uh, were made before that I didn't answer, and it's also related with the challenges we face. I think, Anna, you asked me, uh, why don't we have more students doing this work-based learning yeah and the answer is is basically an economic uh, answer is because the uh, the companies or the hospital they have to provide an income for a student a fellowship and this is our main challenge that uh, companies have to pay the students and they have to have the budget for it and actually this is because our students are super interested on this program of course but uh, this is the main challenge we face that companies are not willing to or have difficulties uh, above all in the public sector to be able to provide fellowships for the students. Indeed, that's uh, that's a very good point uh, and it needs to be taken into consideration. So thank you, thank you again. Um, and, and, and I'm sure many people will contact you uh, after the, the webinar. And now I would like to give the floor to Anna in case she wants to, to highlight uh, some, some takeaways or challenges. Okay, thank you. Uh, what I want to um, underline is that um, uh, I think that apprenticeship is uh, an opportunity for uh, um, uh, different uh, subjects, uh, for talented uh, and competitive people, uh, in order to uh, quick enter the organizations for companies and social enterprises <laughs> to face and experiment um, experiment continuous training and um, uh, um, tutoring uh, uh, with uh, uh, internal people and to um, enhance the skill and the ability of uh, fragile people uh, to stay in the labor market um, and I think that uh, the social economy, uh, taking care uh, of the resources uh, uh, of, of uh, the weakest people, uh, generates value where the economy uh, of performance uh, sees um, limits uh, and burdens. So um, what happens uh, with uh, uh, the pandemic uh, and uh, what follows the pandemic uh, and the fact that uh, firms are now interested in uh, um, people we accompany, uh, I think is uh, something significant uh, and it's uh, uh, a concrete opportunity uh, uh, to um, equality. Many thanks indeed. I, I think we are all trying to work in that direction and that was also the aim of uh, our social economy action plan. So I hope that uh, we make progress and uh, utilize all its potential uh, in the upcoming future. And now, Anna, uh, anything that you would like to add before we wrap up? 
maybe just uh, a couple of remarks um, quite quickly to tackle the challenges that have been uh, explained uh, uh, during this webinar. I would like to mention that the Centers of Vocational Excellence and the European Alliance for Apprenticeships are very important tools to tackle the challenges and reply to the trends that we've been highlighting during the webinar. And then it is a pity that we couldn't see the video of the UVECA project, but I would like to use some words that they shared with me uh, when we discussed apprenticeships, it is that they see, UVECA Projects sees apprenticeships as a way to break the silos between the education world and the labor market. And this is for me uh, a very, very important thing to underline because apprenticeships can help to increase the attractiveness of a sector. They can help to uh, recruit workers for a sector because we often say that the apprentices of today are the skilled workers of tomorrow. And then I will close uh, with that. Thank you. Many thanks, Hannah. Many thanks. Very useful remarks. Uh, so I thank you because more or less uh, you wrap up and, and, and summarize the event. So I don't need to do that. But I would still like to Thank you very much again uh, to our speakers that were uh, really engaging and inspiring to our audience that were really active and dynamic, asking a lot of questions and showing a lot of interest. So we are happy we organized this webinar. Um, but I, I, I would like uh, also to share with you some very practical uh, information. So on the next activities of um, EAFA, you need to stay tuned. We are organizing a high level event in June. Uh, we, you have received an invitation as member of EAFA. The event will be hybrid, uh, so you will be able to follow either online or in person, but you, we encourage you to show your interest that as soon as possible. In the run-up for the event, we also launched a campaign to renew pledges and commitments. So as a member of EAFA, we also uh, would like to encourage you to do so because uh, as time goes by, also our intentions evolved and we would like to reflect uh, appropriately the, the current level um, of, uh, of, of, of the plans of our members. Um, and uh, very soon, uh, and maybe you already know, but for those who are not aware, we are launching the European Year of Skills uh, in Europe today, meaning on Tuesday, with a skills festival. So um, uh, I think my colleagues will be able also to share with you the link so you can register for the event. It will be uh, fully online and, and very dynamic and uh, making links with every uh, many different places uh, in Europe so I, I I think it will be engaging and uh, you can you can follow and I think uh, I'm not um, forgetting anything so I wish you the best many thanks again to you all and stay tuned for news and upcoming events uh, of the Alliance so thank you and uh, see you very soon